To keep up with today's increasing production demands, growers are quickly realizing traditional fertilizers are coming up short. Beyond a single form of sulfur, Microessentials with Fusion Technology delivers sulfate and elemental sulfur for season-long availability. Early in the growing season, sulfate sulfur provides young plants the nutrition needed for optimal growth. But plants dependent on sulfate sulfur alone are left vulnerable to the yield-robbing impact of leaching. But Microessentials is very different. Over time, Microbes in the soil more efficiently convert the elemental sulfur into sulfate, continuously supplying the crop throughout the entire season and beyond. Only Microessentials with Fusion Technology delivers season-long sulfur for steady nutrition throughout the growing cycle, resulting in higher yields and higher profitability. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Red River Farm Network's building here at the Big Iron Farm Show. Glad to have you for this Market Alex seminar this afternoon. I'm Kara Hart, farm broadcaster with the Red River Farm Network team, and we've got Don Wick joining me on the opposite end. Don, maybe give everyone a wave. Randy Conan, who just wrapped up the markets. Sierra Doctor in the back. Sierra, give everyone a wave. Jay Rader is around here as well, and our summer intern, Clara Lyseth, is well, she was in the building. She may not be here. There she is. Give everyone a wave, Claire. Thanks again for joining everyone. We have three excellent market panelists with us today, and I'll introduce them. We've got next to me, Progressive Ag Marketing Market Analyst Brian Strawman. Next to Brian is Betsy Jensen, a farm business management instructor with Northland Technical Community College. That's a lot to say. It is. That's I agree. Did I say I it right? You did fine, yes. Oh, awesome. So, and then we've also got Tommy Grisafi with Advanced Trading that's sitting closest to Don. But before we get into some of the Q&A here today, I wanted to give you a friendly reminder. Um, market panel discussions work really well when you all bring questions. We have a whole bunch of questions, a whole bunch of topics to discuss. But if you have any question at any time for any of these panelists, please raise your hand. We've got two microphones wandering out here through the audience. As long as you raise your hand up high, a team member will see you, hand you a microphone, and you can ask your question. But it's, you know, if you have any question at all, please, please feel free to ask. And I'll go ahead and kick things off here. We got a big USDA report out yesterday uh, you know, this was USDA's chance to reset the bar in so many ways. For all the panelists up here, what, what did you see in the report? And maybe we start with Brian, who's next to me. You know, I think when we look at the report, you know, the surprise in there was, was the soybeans and, and the lower yield, lower production number. But looking at the, the corn numbers, I think the thing that kind of stuck out at me is, you know, the yield was lower. We kind of expected that production down, stocks lower. Uh, but USDA took 100,000 bushels out of uh, exports, out of feed, and another 50,000, uh, again, out of uh, ethanol. So, uh, you know, our stocks came in at just over 1.2 billion. Uh, they took 250 million out of the demand side. You know, if they would have left that in there, uh, you know, our stocks are really, really tight. So I, I think the corn number to me uh, was interesting. What about you, Betsy? So I was surprised. There are demand concerns. I'm not... They were probably right to cut demand a little bit. But it seems like every year they cut demand and then it creeps up again throughout the winter. And so I am anxious. I think there's going to be a lot to be watching over these next couple of months. We know the supply is not there. We know yields are worse, you know, not the yields we had hoped for when we started planting. Um, but they're watching the demand is going to be fun because I think that there is a chance we could earn some of that back. Well, I'll start talking while Don's here. Don's having a rough day. For those of you who don't know, he lost his glasses earlier, but he found those. And now his mic's off. There we go. I'm ca question I was going to ask you, it, uh, that market gave us enough boost yesterday to push us back over 14 bucks. Uh, uh, obviously, soybean yield was a, a bit of a surprise. Uh, uh, how long term is, is uh, the number that we got from USDA? Well, the, it went above $15, actually, and no 23 went above 
fourteen dollars. What what tends to happen in grains is when we were well, this anything can happen now, of course, in the world we're in. But the world doesn't function well on seven dollar corn, and we hit that last night, and it definitely doesn't function well on eight. So if you look at the numbers, it makes you ultra bullish. But then when you you see the markets in that price in a world where like as I'm speaking up here, the Dow's down a thousand right now, does that thirty more days in a row, it'll be at zero. Which would be interesting, especially if it came right at midterms. But um, the the world doesn't run well on high grain prices. So fundamentally, we're ultra bullish, but we're gonna have really big down swoops while that happens. So to think this summer we went 760 corn all the way to 560 corn, I literally sold the dead low, the dead tick. It was a Friday afternoon, grains close at 115, and I sold, I wanted to go home flat, and I sold corn at 119 and 30 seconds, and that was the dead low. And when professionals are getting whipsawed like this, or amateurs or whatever I am, I mean, these are big markets. So corn's already went from 760 to 560, and now we're going back to the top of the range. But somehow we always find a way to swoop down again. Why do you say the market doesn't perform well when corn's at seven, eight bucks? The same reason people travel less when gas was five, and the same reason if you go to a camper store anywhere, there's a ton of campers again. Like, no one wants those big diesel buses getting six miles a gallon. And, uh, well, not no one, but it's, it's, I had one of those. They're very expensive to fill up. And, it, and obviously animals don't know that the price of grain's high, but the, the marketplace has a way of uh, stopping people from using high goods. Just the overall supply and demand kicks in. You know, I know you focus in on livestock a lot. It's actually a sweet spot of yours. And I wondered if you could speak to maybe the response we saw in the livestock markets yesterday from that WASI report, just based off of what Tommy just told us. When feed, you know, when feed prices go up, it affects the livestock sector. Yeah, it does. I mean, you look at the, the expense of feed rations, and, and certainly people have to eat. Uh, we need food. And, and uh, you look at the numbers, our semi-annual cattle inventory report, uh, you know, from July, and you go back to January, and those numbers have tightened. We've had a big uh, issue with drought in, in the country here the last couple of years, and, and I think we've, we've uh, slaughtered a record kill beef cow uh, number all summer long and all spring. So, you know, our numbers continue to tighten, but you, know, you look at the, the feed side of the balance sheet as far as corn goes and, and dropping, uh, you know, corn down again and tightening up that, that feed balance, uh, balance sheet uh, number. Uh, we've still got a lot of pigs. We've still got a lot of cattle. Uh, I think the outlook for the, the livestock side in the next couple of years, especially on the, the uh, cow-calf guys, I think the, the feeders are going to be exciting. I think uh, we've got some excitement as far as, uh, again, the fat calf market, uh, inflation and consumer uh, disposable income, uh, you know, does hang over the market and we have to monitor that too. But again, people still have to eat. So we also talked about in that USDA report out yesterday, the big surprise was in the soybeans. Um, and the fact that USDA lowered their forecasted yield for the U.S. soybean crop more than what traders thought. Um, I guess my question is, did we ever figure out where that loss was coming from in the Midwest, where exactly the, the big losses were and the reduction there? And then also, um, you know, with crop progress and conditions coming out, what do you watch as we move forward to confirm what USDA has forecasted for that estimate? Yeah, whoever wants to answer that. Yeah. I didn't look at the state by state. Well, Sorry. It, looking at the results of the pro farmer crop tour, the pod counts were lower. And I think we just hoped or assumed it wouldn't come true or we'd have a beneficial rain. And now as we look for this crowd here, you guys could really use a rain or could have used a rain a few weeks ago. So the, uh, the way the crop finished up, it had a lot of potential. And uh, it just missed that those last beneficial rains. And there's enough areas and enough states that have problems that it seems to be significant. Is there a concern this corn crop's not going to make it, or how much is that hanging out there? Make it in the sense like full maturity. Oh, here in North Dakota, well, heat looks good. Weather, uh, the weather reports I looked at looked pretty good. Actually, people here in the Red River Valley 
are very excited about their corn crops and very optimistic. I do, do know we have a rain scheduled here in a few days that would help the sugar beet guys tremendously. And uh, no, overall, what's done is done though for some people. Some people who were hot and dry are uh, definitely, uh, you know, the, the folks out west, there's clients here from out west, they kind of burnt up again here late season. Betsy, what about the crop in Minnesota, um, soybeans and corn? How, how's that looking? And do you see some of the losses reflected in what you see at the farm? Yeah, we do see some. Um, you know, talking to my colleagues across the state, you know, you get around the Twin Cities area. So, like, you get north of Faribault, and all of a sudden you hit a wall where it starts to get dry. You go south of there, it looks great. We have had some problem areas even within Minnesota as well. The other thing I was thinking about... Um, you know, the, the tornadoes and the irrigation that we saw. I mean, this spring, we saw a lot of damage come across. We had a lot of irrigated land that was unable to be irrigated in the U.S. You know, Nebraska lost how many? 300 pivots, I think I heard is at one point. Um, so that's a lot of acres that we thought were going to produce something and probably produced a minimal amount. Um, so, I mean, this year did not end up what we had thought it was going to be. We were hoping for more in the U.S. and supply is a little disappointing. So, Brian, what do you watch then in these crop progress and conditions reports, um, you know, to confirm what USDA forecasted yesterday? You know, I, I think you look at the, the drought monitor, and, and I, I look at that index uh, each week and, and uh, continue to look at, at what the forecasts are. It seems like a lot of the extended forecasts do have some moisture in them, or they have this summer, and we get to that point, and especially in the West, it just didn't materialize. So... We do see uh, some poorer crops in, in the western end of the Corn Belt. Eastern Corn Belt, I think, has more potential, and, and uh, we'll find out when the combines start to roll. But uh, again, I think uh, production was hurt, and we did have a drier summer, uh, like Tommy talked about, too. If you're sitting in Brazil and you're looking at that crop report yesterday, what does that mean to you? Is that going to encourage any more South American acres? Yes, start the chainsaws, cut down the forest, and let it rip. I mean. From when I was a kid at the Board of Trade, how many hectares, they call them, they planted. When I was younger, which now I'm older, in 1990, Brazil was not a big player in the soybean market. Now here in 2022, they are uh, bigger than us, and that probably hurts the American farmer's ego. And they're going to continue to get bigger because we're in the business now of building houses and dollar stores on land, and we're in, all good production farmland in the United States is pretty much being used. I was thinking about that yesterday, as excited the as I was. The dollar store? The dollar store, yes, <laughs> right, yeah. You know, nothing's really a dollar there, by well, the way. Well, how are they remodeled? They were just built like three years I ago. I don't Why know are what's okay, going anyway. on over there. Back on topic. Um, so I was thinking of that yesterday as I'm looking at the soybean market, getting excited about how high it was, and then I thought, oh, South America. I mean, in a perfect world, we want to maybe push this rally back a little bit so that South America doesn't encourage them to go out in the field, but we got it. We're grateful for the rally, but... Yeah, it's definitely going to light a fire under some more people to plant soybeans. Maybe the million-dollar question, can they do it? Do they have the infrastructure to do it? They have the production probably capacity to do it. Do they have infrastructure to do it? They always do. I mean, they get it done. Um, we Thinking about infrastructure, you know, the, the uh, Ukrainian wheat. They were never going to export a bushel. And you know, I know there's still a lot to be settled with that, but somehow... Farmers find a way. I mean, you guys know, look how horrible our spring was. We still got stuff planted. Um, never doubt the ability of the world's farmers to get the job done. I, I think we forget about that sometimes. When you take a look at, you mentioned Ukraine, the, I don't know if I've ever seen in my lifetime, the, the geopolitical forces that are, are at play. We talk about maybe COVID shutdowns, additional COVID shutdowns in China. Obviously, what's... Uh, going on with uh, Ukraine and, and Russia right now. Uh, there's a lot of things that are, are happening worldwide that uh, we could wake up tomorrow and change uh, what this market's doing pretty quickly. How much is the grain trade paying attention to what's happening in those outside markets? Want me to take a stab at it? Sure. Outside markets, uh, well, two sets of outside markets. Russia has a lot of wheat and Ukraine had a lot of grain, but somehow the world absorbed it. And I think, that's just my opinion, is that the world was very used to going uh, with everything, not just grain, food, parts, anyone looking for any parts were short of everything. But everything went just in time. And when that grain did come out of the Ukraine, I don't know where it went, but they gobbled it up quickly. And there was some uh, 
it was it was out of condition a little bit and everything else. But the I think the world's in a stacking up mode, and countries who need food to we all need food, but some countries worse than other. I think when the markets dipped down this year, and that's when that grain came out, it was actually that Friday afternoon when they finally said, you know, the boats are leaving, that was the low. That grain got absorbed, and I would say is all spoken for now. And so we're in a stacking up phase. The world is trying to keep a little extra grain around for the next whatever. And uh, it's amazing. We're having a hard, for the first time ever that I ever remember, we cannot produce enough grain to keep up with the world's demand, hence why the prices are so high. The whole conversation about food insecurity really has become part of the conversation. Well, and I think, you know, when we saw the Ukraine issue first arrive, I mean, that is why we had, had that huge premium in the wheat market. I mean, wheat took off based on that. You know, fundamentally, looking at the supply-demand numbers, we shouldn't have had spring wheat in the teens. I mean, I don't, I don't know that I can connect enough dots to get spring wheat back to the teens, but there was just so much uncertainty, and now that things have calmed down again, which is what we expected to happen, um, we don't have, unfortunately, we don't have spring wheat in the teens anymore. Speaking of Russia and Ukraine, you know, there's been some questions about some of the quality of the grain that's been shipped out. What are your all's perspective on, you know, the export situation that's been happening? Um, and just in general, what's happening over in Russia and Ukraine? Brian? You know, I, I think you look at uh, some of those first ships, I think they were talking about quality concerns. Uh, you know, that grain was actually loaded on some of those ships, you know, months ago, and it sat there in the water. So, yeah, there's going to be some issues with that when it gets to the destination. Uh, <clears throat> the grain that's in the elevators or, you know, gets loaded later, I think there's maybe not the quality concerns, you know, that uh, we had with those earlier shipments. And I think you look at the wheat market, too. You know, they're, they're talking about a record crop in Russia, a big crop in Australia. You look at the worldwide wheat situation and wheat's growing and harvested and planted every day of the year, you know, year round someplace. So I think the bigger thing that we've seen that supported the wheat market too is maybe the logistics of getting it to where it needs to go. Uh, like Betsy said, $14, uh, you know, wheat back in May and we traded back down to 860, I think was the low, you know, quite a, quite a drop, but uh, there probably wasn't any reason for it to be at 14 and probably not any reason for it to be at 860 either. I think since the middle of July, we've traded pretty close to nine bucks, you know, and, and both sides of that. And, and uh, we're just waiting for some fresh news uh, to come out and see where we go from here. You know, seven, eight months ago when Russia invaded Ukraine, I think you and I talked at that time, Tommy, we thought this was going to be a slam dunk and be done within a week and a half, two weeks. And now, again, seven, eight months later, Ukraine's making inroads, uh, taking back some of the, the area that, they, that Russia had uh, had in, in their control. Uh, there's also folks in, in Russia now talking about Putin needing to resign. That shakes up the entire global scheme. Um, what does that do that if there's continued unrest there, or this advancement with Ukraine, does that have some influence on us? Uh, it will, but I, I will say it's been incredibly easier to be a broker and analyst because I can honestly say I have no clue what's going on, and I mean it. And I don't have to apologize for it either. So we got to every day wake up, watch the news. Hopefully it's reliable. Obviously listen to Red River Farm Network. That is a reliable source of information. And, uh, Thanks for the love, Tommy. <laughs> we'll be here all week. Um, cats are on the left. And, uh, but it's a new era. It's a, it, American farmers, y'all in this crowd are are the beneficiary of the debacle happening in the world. And um, there's also some really great things happening too. So when we do start overproducing grain again, we have, uh, we have all these new businesses that have found North Dakota. I don't know if they didn't know where it was or whatever, but we're starting to have crushing plants and we're, we're starting to export less of our grain. So we're using so much of our grain domestically and with biofuels and what people want the Green New Deal to be, and it will happen. It may not happen in the right, there may be some bumps along the way, like energy prices going tenfold in Europe and Russia, but the world needs to find out its energy situation in grains and ethanol and soybean oil and canola oil are a big part of that. And so normally when I sit here, except for last year we were rallying the day I was here, 
it's normally doom and gloom, but this room should be as excited as any other farm group in America. Regardless of what happens in the war, it, it, this, this too will pass. One interesting thing, and I'll hand it back to others, but when the Queen died, I was, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was driving, but I had Sling TV on my phone, but I wasn't, I was listening. But they said something that struck me, that the Queen was friends with Winston Churchill. The Queen had met with John F. Kennedy. I didn't really care about the Queen. I'm more worried about the grandkids, who's marrying who, who's getting divorced, you know, all the stuff like that. But the history of what she had witnessed and that she'd went through so many prime ministers, so many American presidents, I have to tell this room that this too will pass. And put your head down, grow bushels, and know what to do with them. And things are really, really good up here. Now, hopefully no one who wants to bid up land prices watching this live because they'll bid up land on you. But most of you own a lot of land, and your kids will never have to work again anyway. So it's all good. <laughs> you touched on the crush plants, and I think that, at least... From my perspective, that has the potential to be a game changer when we look at what we have in Spearwood and Castlewood, Aberdeen, Sock and Crookston. I mean, there's a lot of things happening. What's that mean for us in this part of the world where we're used to sending everything out to PNW? Well, like on our farm, we've never grown this much canola, but it sure is handy to haul it to CHS and Hallock. Um, we would never have grown that canola. That would have been probably soybean acres. Um, so it is nice to have it domestic and have that domestic market. And then even the potential to have, you know, additional livestock operations up here. I know that's made the headlines, you know, and it's not always pro, a little bit of con sometimes too, but to have a domestic market for our product and not have to worry about China and or Russia and Ukraine or what China is buying, it really does provide a little bit of peace of mind and a little bit of stability. Do you hear anything about folks maybe thinking about ramping up soybean production because of those, you know, um, proposed soy crush facilities? Someone, we were out doing a, just field checks one day and someone had mentioned to me, Carrie, you know that the Midwest, the, the corn belt is moving further north and year after year we're going to see more corn and soybeans move further north. So I just wondered if you're starting to see some of the interest in growing some of that. Is it too early to know because we're not into next year yet? Yeah, I would think it's maybe too early to know. I, I think you start talking about the Corn Belt moving north, and I think a lot of that comes from seed technology. I, you, gosh, you look at what corn, uh, what our production was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and what we can produce now. Uh, and in our environment, you know, we had a, a cool, wet spring. We got it planted late. You look at where that corn is today, and, and granted, we had a, a warm summer and had some rain, but gosh, that technology, that seed technology, I think, is, is pushing that corn belt farther north. As far as the, the, the plants coming into play, I think it, it builds some competition, maybe helps the basis, uh, you know, just makes uh, it more exciting for the farmers to have some, you know, different markets available to them, too. So uh, I think it's, uh, it, it's good for the area, good for the community. As far as switching acres, I think a lot of guys have rotations. I don't see them, you know, switching a bunch of acres from corn to beans just because there's a bean plant here. Uh, there's also an ethanol plant as well, and, and uh, there's some elevators and there's some livestock operations, and, and I think rotations are a bigger thing. On a much smaller level, you know, if you're talking about something like oats, I haven't had any farmers who have grown oats. This year, I got a good handful that grew oats. I think that the, you know, the oat buyers last year couldn't get their oats out of Canada. I mean, we had a real shortage of oats, and they decided they wanted some domestic production, and they put out some aggressive contracts, and um, we are fortunate to live where we are, where we are not restricted to corn and beans. I mean, I think we're very lucky that we have some alternatives to just the two crops. i got to ask, where do those oats go? I, th I believe Faustin had the contract. Is anybody out there right now that had one? And then one? people used them for cover crops, too. With People who did have PP, they had to use them for cover crops. Yeah. So. Ryan, you talked about livestock. Um, with those crush plants, that just... Is natural for us to be growing pigs and chickens and turkeys and those kind of things. Do you see North Dakota can turn that page and, and make that happen? You know, you look at our environment up here, and to do feedlots, the wintertime gets kind of tough on, on doing feedlots here in North Dakota. Uh, the kill plants are all to the south. Uh, Backrounding, growing those calves out, I think, uh, is certainly an opportunity. Uh, all the byproducts that come from these plants, a huge thing uh, when you look at uh, these ration, feed ration expenses. 
and uh, I think that's a big benefit as well. Um, you know, you have to look at the logistics and where all that, the, that food has to go, where all that meat has to go, and, and that's why those plants are kind of through the central U.S., and we ship the, the livestock down there, they get processed and then moved out to where they need to go. So I, I just think our environment's a little bit tough up here for, for uh, feedlots. Can we talk about a strengthening in basis? Do you all remember how strong basis, like in a, of a basis improvement we're supposed to have because of those soy crush plants coming in to play here? Not off the top of my head. We, yeah. I mean, we got a pretty good basis right now for fall. You know, corn and soybeans off the combine. And I was also going to ask that, too. Mm -hmm. I know you watch basis. We all do. Oh, um, yeah. But what are you seeing in your area, Betsy, for harvest? Yeah, I think basis looks, I mean, from a historical perspective, I guess I'm old enough, I still think that corn should be probably 75, 65, 75 under at basis, and now we're looking at 30, 35. Um, so there is good demand. Um, same thing with soybeans. I think remember when, um, what, 20, when would the China thing start? We were 220 under for basis. We had a $2.20 under basis, um, and now we're at 30, maybe 40 cent under basis. Um, so I think it's very enticing to deliver. There is a cost to put it in and out of the bin. I hope farmers remember that. Again, a reminder, if you have questions, give us a, a wave. Uh, Randy's out with the microphone, and um, Sarah's got one as well. We'd, we'd love to get uh, your questions asked. I think the, always, the best questions come from the audience. Uh, I was at a session yesterday that uh, Northern Crops Institute put on in, in Moorhead, uh, looking at the, the next five years, and I couldn't be there for the whole day, but the one speaker in the morning talked about the U.S. and China really being on a, a collision course. you got two superpowers that uh, are really trying to compete. Um, he thought we're kind of in a sweet spot yet for, for exports in, in the short term, but he was a little, uh, a little more pessimistic once we get past that five-year time period. For China, are we too dependent on them as far as exports in the ag sector? I would say so, that obviously we need China, China needs us. I, I just don't think they'll ever be able to not need us. And we, uh, obviously, if Taiwan's a very uh, big hot spot, and there's a lot of factors as, you know, I can't tell you what's gonna happen five minutes from now, and he's given a five-year outlook. It's, it's incredible to think uh, what will happen. But one thing about every five years is that technology doubles and we consume as consumers. I listened to a podcast the other day, and we will consume double the technology five years from now that we're consuming now. And technology is a big part of agriculture, and there's this thing going on with the chips. We're trying to make it harder for uh, uh, chips and whatnot. And it's big business. It's big business. They're a good trading partner, and I'm, I'm not so sure uh, how bad it's going to get, but I don't know where we'd get our TVs from and everything else. You know, I don't know. There's big trade with us in overseas and components. We do not make semiconductors in the United States, and that's why that I didn't realize it till Nancy Pelosi went over there, and I thank her for that and her husband, Paul, for buying the, NAS, buying the semiconductor companies before. That was good. But... Nonetheless, I did learn a lot during that period of how important that a lot of, you know, that we could have a war over a semiconductor and where we get them. What's your take on the importance of that Chinese market? Uh, are we too dependent? Oh, I think we absolutely, are. well, not for everything. For soybeans, absolutely. Um, but I don't know what the other option is. I mean, in time, I hope we evolve that we don't become so dependent on that. And we're doing some of that with, you know, biodiesel demand, we're, we're doing a few things differently. Um, I, don't, I don't know that it's necessarily a bad thing because they're dependent on us too. Right. So I, I don't know that it's a crisis, but I would, you know, you look at like who buys our wheat and who buys our corn, there's a lot more countries. You look at who buys our soybeans, the pie chart is China. I mean, there are a couple that are little ones, but it, it is a little intimidating, but so far it's working. Let's not... Let's not upset the apple cart. Well, and they've been making some purchases lately too, at least what we know of, right? So far, yeah, they're, they're doing fine. There are you know, obviously some concerns about their economy. Um, there's a little bit of slowdown in China and that would kind of ripple over to the US, but um, we already saw that yesterday when USDA cut export sales for soybeans though too. They said, eh, we're not gonna sell quite as many. 
So USDA has already plugged in some of those lower, lower bushels. So how do you all keep accurate track without having the weekly export sales data to kind of back up or at least prep you for the inspections that come out too? How do you, how have you navigated the last month in tracking some of those things, Brian? You know, it just gets to be kind of hard when you don't have those USDA numbers each week. Uh, you listen for the announcements and you kind of monitor things. And, and we're in a period right now too where export demand has slowed. Uh, you know, a lot of demand now comes out of uh, Brazil and, and Argentina. And, and uh, you look at the pork side of things, they've certainly grown their sow herd and less dependent upon our pork as well. But, you know, our, our pork uh, exports have been very sluggish this summer. And a lot of that was the demand that we saw from China, you know, last year. So uh, that certainly slowed down as well. You think they're taking advantage of flying under the radar and not having to, you know, share some of all the, the sales and things like that? Or is it to be determined until later this week? We're supposed to be finding out later on this week what, what yeah, that data think, has been. I think on Thursday they released like four weeks of yep. data. So yep. uh, there will be a lot of information coming out Thursday. That all happened when USDA was going to transition to a, a new platform. And the day it came out, every trader we're looking at is like scratching their head because the numbers didn't make any sense at all. Uh, so they actually pulled everything, and I think they're going back to the former thing when we get stuff out uh, on Thursday. That lack of information, uh, is that a concern? How surprised are you that USDA uh, released something when it wasn't ready for prime time? I don't know that it's a, should you expect the government to have good computer programs, Don? Let's just lower the bar here. Um, so I was surprised though that we got an acreage adjustment I mean, they made some pretty big adjustments in the WASD report, so apparently the computers are working fine for that. Um, I don't know that I'm overly concerned about the glitch with U.S. I mean, it was caught pretty quickly. I don't, I don't know that it caused any long-term problems, and I don't, I'm not worried about it in the long run. Let me switch gears to recession. Uh, good or bad for agriculture? Well, every... Seven, ten years, we have a pretty good recession, and agriculture just keeps going. I mean, they're on different cycles right now. So we're in a high price uh, environment right now in agriculture. The, the worst thing that could happen to agriculture, especially young producers or anyone probably under the age of 40, 45, is interest rates after today's move are scheduled maybe to go up another three-quarters percent, maybe one percent. So right now there's about a 30% chance we're going to go up one whole percent in a week or two, and then maybe another three quarters after that. We spent so much time at low interest rates that people older and younger, but especially younger, um, that the younger generation doesn't realize the cost of paying 7% operating. And uh, I doubt if we walk through there, we'll see many signs that say 0% financing. Any big ag people here have 0% financing out there today? Raise your hand, I'll put on my glasses. I want to see who the heck you are. 0% <laughs> financing is done. Okay, good. And so we're back to what, when you were a kid, and you're still a kid, <laughs> an older kid, but you remember the 80s, and uh, this is different than the 80s because the Fed's so far behind what's happening that if they were worried about interest rates, the second that CPI number, if they were worried about inflation, sorry, I misspoke, if they were worried about inflation, the second that CPI number came out today, there would have been an emergency Fed raise 1% to 2%. And if you're going to have interest rates at 2.5% and CPI at 85 we're going to continue to run hot. Unlike when Paul Volcker nuked it and he said, I'm going to get rid of, in I'm going to get rid of inflation. He really did. Our, our government, there's no way our Federal Reserve 56 days before a midterm of administration that had appointed all those folks is going to massively raise interest rates. But markets are smart, and that's why the Dow's down 1,000. They know more is coming. And so releasing the oil from the strategic reserve was very smart, and you gotta give credit when credit's due. The markets were inverted, and our government released all that oil. And even releasing all that oil and taking oil from 120 down to 80, CPI only went down a little bit. And that CPI number was before yesterday's grain number. Our grain markets are going to fall back into that. So we still have real big inflation and the Fed's pretending they're on it, but they're not. It's like when you go to a restaurant and someone's kids are being bad and the parents tell them to be quiet and they're still bad, and then they're smacking them, right? I'm more of a smacker. 
But the Fed is not going to do that. I don't know. The, I heard pain used in that one speech. At the but it was a word, and you cannot talk down inflation verbally. You have to raise the interest rate. So how do we have this combination of high inflation and, and low unemployment? You can't, everybody's looking for a, you know, every place we go to has got a job wanted uh, sign in their window. That's kind of a strange phenomenon that we're dealing with as well. Oh, it's, it's bizarre. I mean, I don't, so you know, looking at you guys in the audience, you're all trying to figure out, you just want us to tell you our soybeans going higher or lower, right? I mean, that's all you want to know. Like, should I sell or should I buy? But you look at some of these, the smartest people in the world, like you look at, you open up a Wall Street Journal and it says, we have no idea what this economy is doing. Like we don't, nothing makes sense. A, one plus one is not equaling two anymore. We, we have this inflation, the unemployment, nothing is making sense. And it's kind of like, well, that's kind of what farmers, we always deal with the grain marketing. We have no idea what's going on. And I feel like a... I feel a little bit of kinship right now with like uh, all the big bankers who are listing off the prepare for this, well, but maybe a little bit of this. Um, so as farmers, I think all we can do is mar like we have margins we need to protect. And so, I mean, if you're buying fertilizer here, buying fuel, I mean, 23 prices are pretty respectable. We got to keep a margin in there. Um, that's really the goal of farming is to maintain those margins. Um, and that is right now looking at 23, you know, if you were to buy your, your fertilizer today, look at some fuel, we got decent prices for next year. And that's, I think, what we need to stay focused on is the margin. And um, interest rates are certainly going to come in. And then and, and I think we're going to see that at the end of the year when farmers get their interest rate statements and see how much accrued interest they own. It's not something that they are aware of today. They haven't physically gotten a bill for their interest. Okay? No one's gotten, you're not getting a bill for your operating loan, but you're going to get that coming up here in the fall, and it's going to smack you on the side of the head and go, "How? what? This is uh, significantly more than a year ago. Can I add to that? And that's a, a great thing. The cost of carrying grain, of storing yeah. grain, and I like storing grain, and I like bushels, bins, and bases, but when interest rates are this hot and transportation costs are this high and labor is this short, you better think long and hard about not selling that inverse at harvest. Would you agree? Absolutely. Well, there you go. I'm done. Okay, excellent. <laughs> Anyone want to argue? So, no. So, like I'll say, last year we sold all the canola off the field, which it was a mistake. I mean, prices went higher in the winter. But I'm driving by the canola plant one day, and there's a semi that was in the ditch. Missed the, it was a horrible day to haul. The semi was in the ditch, and I thought, you know, that's not me. I'm going to try to take a little bit of solace in the fact that I might have sold it a little bit too early, but at least I don't have a semi in the ditch. It's 20 below. I mean, it just, I felt a little better about having less canola in the bins than, than that but guy was hauling. You could have bought it back. I know I could have, but I still had soybeans. It's an oil seed. I kind of, you know, when you have this many crops, you got to kind of pick and choose your risk. What Sounds do you like you have a tax problem. Oh. You don't want to pay taxes. Can we switch uh, to not paying taxes? Obviously, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. I should always sell at the low. That'll work. Yeah. But then the government will give you money because you're struggling. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> you, so, you all are laughing. You all just got your last round of checks. I know. Yeah. You should be embarrassed. I know. Becky, In a good way. I'm going to ask I get them too. Oh, gosh. Okay. Are you done? <laughs> <laughs> He's never done. No. Let's see how many of the farmers you work for have already priced in some of their inputs for next year. Quite a few of them, um, especially like fall fertilizer. You know, I don't know that you want to, fertilizer is just crazily volatile too. I mean, we look at, you know, we don't, we can't follow the futures. You know, you guys aren't quoting us fertilizer prices every day, but um, fertilizer is crazy volatile as well. And so, I mean, I was talking to a guy today. I said, you know, I got my fall booked. He said, I think that's what we're going to do. We're going to book the fall and... Hopefully we don't have to pay, you know, a thousand bucks for nitrogen in the spring. You know, just try to, to, to hedge yourself a little bit, not do it all at one time. It is, it is terrifying. And I've been watching the margin protection insurance. The volatility, even on fertilizer prices, that volatility percentage is crazy high. Um, it's, there's a lot of unknowns. That's, and I'm just trying to protect a margin. Brian, what about you? A lot of farmers you work with lock in some of those input needs, too. You know, some guys have, and I, I think just the, the worry of the availability uh, as we move forward I, and, and a lot of talk of, of higher prices as we move through fall and into spring. Uh, 
uh, some guys have locked that in. And I think going back to what Tommy and Betsy said too is, you know, it doesn't hurt to buy some of those inputs, some of that fertilizer, some of that fuel, but if you're doing that, make sure that you'd hedge some of that off with some sales on that new crop too. Uh, you just hate to have that, that price drop. And you can go back to 2012 when we saw the, the drought come into play and we saw those markets take off the middle of June and they, they actually peaked out, I think, August 28th. The market started to come down. Everybody thought they were going to come back, and they didn't. Uh, it was a slow, you know, longer tail down, but they just didn't come back. So uh, take advantage of that opportunity if, if you're purchasing some product. You know, we haven't talked about this too much, but you, Tommy, and Betsy were talking about storage. You know, what is the cost of storage on the farm and taking it into the elevator? You know, at the end of this week, we're going to find out whether or not, um, you know, rail workers may be on a strike or a lockout. What kind of a factor would that throw into a wrench, you know, in, in moving the crop? Should farmers be thinking about how to, how to hedge that and make that work? I mean, this is all to be determined, right? We don't know yet, but no. how much of that do you have to factor into the business? I don't know. What are the odds of a strike? I haven't, I mean, I don't know enough about it. I'm, I'm, I don't it's know on my radar that I'm panicking about it, but I'm not going to panic too hard. I will say okay. that some of the railroads, from what I've read, have already started making plans. And uh, there is a midterm in 55 days. I mean, it's not, regardless of politics, it is not good to ever have the rail down for a minute or an hour or a day. So if they strike, from what I've been told, it's most likely maybe they strike and then the administration comes in and says, what do we need to do to, come on, let's work this out, let's go back to the tables and talk. And so it, the event may happen, but the, the timeliness of it would be the, hopefully no one goes for the nuclear option, that would be bad. And I, I, it's not to anyone's benefit to not be working for too long. We just came out of COVID, you know, a few weeks to cure, the, to cure everything and we're, we're still reeling from it. So we know when we stop things, the, how bad that is. And I think everyone knows that and respects that. But it's like a secret club, the railroad people who know about all this stuff. Yeah. I don't know who the best source of information for that would be on. Well, if you look at our basis, like at the local, that has not changed. They don't seem to be panicking about it yet. Um, but when you see that basis start to change, then you'd probably be in more panic mode. Yeah, I mean, we still got a long ways to harvest, though, too. You know, yep. I mean, wheat is wheat is mostly done. I'm assuming that the big flush has already moved through the system. Soybeans are still going to be a little while. Corn is really going to be a little while. So I'm I'm optimistic that there will be a solution. Like Tommy says, with the with the uh, election coming up too, that's not something we want to be impacting things. Okay. Betsy, I'm curious. How many of your customers have 23 crops sold, and how much? Um, not that many, I would say, honestly. Um, I'll probably have to sit down with them and smack them around a little bit, um, because, I mean, I just think that something should be done. The cost extra for that, or how's that? Yeah, yep, yep. <laughs> um, I also threatened them if anybody buys machinery in December, they will get a stern talking to about trying to tax plan, um, but with buying machinery. Um, so when you look at 23, I mean, I look at where I started 22, and I'm not going to tell you guys where I started 22, because it's not good. It was pretty low. Um, and so now we're looking at 23 prices, and my gosh, like, I, if, I can, if I can keep bumping up my starting price by a buck or two every year, I'll be in good shape for the rest of my career. Uh, I just think it's, it's a pretty respectable place to get started. Betsy, earlier this spring, you were traveling around and talking about some of the work that you do, and you passed out these little square cards of commodity prices. And you said, keep these in your wallet as a reminder of where we've been. Do you have your card with you today? You know, I don't have my card with me today. But no, I did a, I did a snapshot in time that this is what it is today. I wrote the date on it. I didn't put my name on it, though, at all. Like, I don't want to come back to haunt me. Um, but I handed them out at a couple meetings that you can pull it out and just kind of remind yourself of where we've been. When we trade wheat from 14 to 860, it's hard to remember the opportunities that we had. I mean, it's you forget about where things have been, but I think also looking to the future where we might see, I mean, we could see easily $3 volatility back in the wheat market. I'm not saying all that's going to be higher either. I mean, we might go lower. It, it's just going to be very volatile. Um, and I am... I, somebody showed me a slide yesterday, our mental health professional in Minnesota, she gave us a presentation and she said, um, when you're under stress, 
I will say this spring, that was Betsy. Betsy was under stress, <laughs> a little stressed about planting. You tend to exaggerate all the problems, okay? So this spring, we were never gonna get planted. I was way oversold. And even if we did get planted, we weren't gonna have anything for yields. That was me. If you would have called me on June 1st, that was, all, that was my head. All three of those things didn't happen. I know, but June 1st, Betsy oh, thought know. that it was. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and you had millions of dollars on the line. Exactly. Right. And so when it's, it's real, we had, I mean, we, I had sold corn. We're going to put corn in the ground. I don't care that it's May 22nd. We're putting corn in the ground. Um, so when you're under stress and you're making poor decisions, every scenario seems like it's going to be the worst case scenario. And I need to learn to dial back my stress a little bit. So um, something I know we always talk about big iron is harvest lows. Um, do you know if we've hit harvest lows in the grain markets yet? How will we, I guess we'll know usually after it happens, but what's your take on that, all of you? You know, I, I think Tommy's talked about it, Betsy's talked about it, but the volatility in the market. I mean, gosh, you come, on, come in tomorrow and, and who knows where we're gonna be and, and the market's gonna move and, and why is it moving? So I think we're in a different scenario. In a way, uh, you've got some inflation talk, you've got an election coming up, you've got the Ukraine-Russian war, uh, interest rates continue to climb and, and there's the, the economies, uh, not just us, but around the world as well. I think there's so many things that come into play that uh, it's, it's just hard to figure out. You look at the lows I think we put in, in wheat back in May and, and I think it was in, uh, or maybe the first part of July uh, was the high. And then we put the lows in here recently and, and the same with the corn and the beans. They were back in maybe June and, and then uh, we came in and put those uh, uh, lows back in and we bounced off of that. But, you know, there's just an awful lot of volatility. You know, last year we delivered wheat off the combine. I got 917. So that was my barometer that I used all year. Like I can't sell for worse than 917 because I delivered it right off the combine. No protein discounts, no storage, no nothing. Like I can't, and for a good chunk of the winter, prices were below 917. I mean, there was a good percentage of the time that I was regretting not delivering every bushel. And then of course we had our Russia, Ukraine came in, sent prices higher. Um, so to say that we're at harvest low is maybe harvest, maybe a short term low, but I think December, January, I mean, I think this market's volatile. I don't think, I feel quite confident that prices will go lower at some point this winter. It's just, that's the nature of the markets right now. I think you touched on earlier what was happening in Europe with these uh, natural gas, Energy is certainly a, a huge component of what we do in agriculture. With this natural gas component, does that have any impact on corn acres for next year, or are we it, too soon into that play? No, it, it's real. It, it'll have, it'll have uh, electricity and natural gas will play into a lot of things that we, we're not thinking about, like automobile windows and glass being made. The amount of energy that's used to produce and manufacture anything uh, if, if things don't right themselves quickly in the next few months in Europe, in particular Germany, um, it could be very bad. And I think that's what, you know, as you see Putin start to, I don't want to say lose, I'm no war expert here, but as he's doing not as well in the war as he'd like, back to you and I thinking it'd be over in 10 days, the one thing he can do to hurt him is energy. And it, it's going to work. It's going to wreck those economies. I have a, a cousin who lives in the UK and her average electric bill was $50, and she, she received a notice that us, the UK government, did you a favor, your bill won't be higher than $400 per month. But she's freaking out. She's graduated law school, and uh, I said, well, welcome to socialism, you know, but uh, she doesn't talk to me much anyway, and I could see why. <laughs> but um, it's her mom doesn't talk to me either. But I said that to her mom, and she didn't think it was funny, but what do you think's going to happen? And we, the world is on the verge, or the world is having the largest ever man-made energy shortage ever. And I don't think there's a person in the room who's going to argue with me that we don't have plenty of resources in the great state of North Dakota, and we're being handicapped, which is not, is not a good thing. And politics matter. Decisions matter. And they made their bed, and they're going to have to lay in it. And of course, yes, to answer your question, it's going to affect fertilizer, and it's going to very much affect industry, and it's going to affect those countries' ability to produce protein. Like, it would not be feasible 
to have a hog barn or any of these other uh, facilities. Real you quick here, I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to ask a question, or at least one person does. We are running out of time for this panel, so if you have a question, now would be the time to raise your hand and ask it. Continue, Tommy. Didn't mean to cut you off. Sorry. No, that's that's it. I mean, it's it's really scary what's happening. So we're blessed to live in America. We do have ample energy. Uh, I know I would have to throw out thousands of dollars of food if I lost power for more than 12 hours. We're that dependent on energy. And so is the rest of the world. We've got a very smart crowd in here, but uh, there's always a, new, a need for, for more education, particularly when it's markets. I think we're always scratching our head on some of these things uh, that are happening. Where should we go when we're looking for more information? What, uh, where do you guys look for as far as information sources? So I'm going to give you the non-egg one. I mean, I love the Wall Street Journal. I mean, just, and it seems like it's more relevant now. Like, I think about when I, back in my brokerage days, all I did was read DTN. I mean, like, it just, the, the news feed came through steady. But we seem to be influenced more by the outside economy right now. Um, so, yeah, I just have the app. And whenever they have an article on egg, I panic because... Oh, don't, don't notice our wheat market. Don't notice how high wheat prices are. I want it to keep under the radar. Um, but, I mean, I almost think we need to be more educated as farmers on world issues. I mean, that's what we've been talking most of this time about, or general market issues. Interest rates, inflation, all this stuff is coming and affecting our, well, land prices, our, our, our new loans, our commodity prices. I just think if you can find a good source of non-ag information... Um, I like the app, so. That's a great question, Don. I was hoping you'd ask me that. <laughs> but I, I don't subscribe to it now, but I probably will in the next few days. The Financial Times. Yes, that, I like that. They one. always show you a Twitter, and you go to click on it, and you can't get the link because mm -hmm. they want you to subscribe. I'm going to have to subscribe because things are okay in America, although the Dow's down 1,150 now. And uh, who was planning on retiring anyway, right? But what's hit... The, the, the real core of the explosions over there. It's not here. Things are good. There was a line to all the food booths today. We're okay over here. And they all had electricity. But over there, it's a problem. And financial, is it yep. called? Financial, financial Times. Times. And if you order the paper, it's like yellow. Yeah, it's yellow, yeah. It's a great publication. Yeah, I, I haven't it. read it forever, but I was listening again to a podcast, and they mentioned Financial Times. I'm like, maybe it's time to subscribe to that and get a different world view because there's a lot of things going on over there. What Brian? about you, Brian? Yeah, you know, I think Betsy and Tommy have, have covered a couple key ones, and I think there's just so much information out there. Uh, you know, when you Google something, you can Google just about anything you want to. And I think if you spend some time and you search through different things, uh, read a bunch of different articles, read as much as you can, expose yourself to all those outside market forces, and find the things that you like that make sense that, that you can kind of follow the trail on. And uh, there's a lot of information, more than... You can actually absorb, but I think if you can find some good, good things that, that are out there and they're hidden, uh, you know, go ahead and use them and, and follow them. Well, we should take note, uh, we are running out of time. If you guys, if folks have one-on-one -on -one questions, you're going to be around for a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, certainly uh, invite you to connect with these two, or these three. Uh, Tommy Grisafi with us from Advanced Trading, uh, Betsy Jensen, uh, Farm Business Management Instructor, always catch your uh, column in, in Prairie Grains. Ryan Stroman, uh, Ryan came up to bat for us today. Uh, Ray called in sick, I guess, so uh, appreciate you, you helping us out today, uh, Brian, uh, of course, from Progressive Ag. I would also like to remind you a couple other things. Uh, we got a, a session on land values coming up in just a couple minutes with the crew from Farmers National Company, and at 3.30, uh, talking uh, succession planning, estate planning, those kind of things with the Freedom Financial Group. Uh, that's at 3.30, and if uh, you want to go back and catch something you missed uh, today, all of our stuff is being uh, streamed on, uh, online with uh, yourliveevent.com. So just go onto their website and look down on their schedule and you'll be able to pull up any of our, our seminars and they'll be on YouTube afterwards as well. So if you didn't catch one of these live, you can catch them later uh, as well. So again, on behalf of the Red River Farm Network team, I would also like to make note, my bride, Colleen uh, Wick, is on our team as well. She's uh, back of the room. We didn't introduce her earlier. Sorry, so. Colleen. Love you. <laughs> there you go. And uh, let's give our crowd, our, uh, our folks, a good hand here. Thank you.